Today I'm going to talk about autonomous vision-controlled micro-flying robots. Micro-flying robots are um, aerial vehicles, like the one shown in this picture, or the one actually recently on that table over there. What is really special about this platform is that this platform is completely different from the ones that you can buy in the toy stores or in the supermarkets. This platform, in fact, is completely autonomous, and it can fly all by itself, which means without a remote control, without any human intervention. Also, another unique feature about this platform is that it doesn't use GPS to navigate like our passenger aircraft. It doesn't use lasers, it doesn't use radars like potential autonomous cars. Actually, in order to navigate, it only uses a vision system like we humans do, which for a robot actually are made by cameras. Probably you are asking yourself, why are we interested in autonomous microflying robots? Because I believe that these robots will soon have a major impact in our society. A great advantage of these robots is that they can access to environments where humans cannot access to, because they can fly. So if you took, think about uh, search and rescue operations, you can think of uh, sending these helicopters, for example, after an earthquake, to search for survivors, or uh, even just to monitor the interior of the buildings, and uh, potentially build a map of the environment in order to plan the actions of the human rescue teams. Another interesting application is, for example, environment monitoring. You can think of uh, sending a, a swarm of these helicopters in order to test the pollution of the air or even to detect fires. But also you can use these helicopters to do remote inspection, for example, to help humans or even to replace humans in all those dangerous operations, like uh, um, the inspection of uh, the combustion chambers of power plants. So there are thousands of applications where the, these robots can be actually useful. And, uh, in order to e explore the possibilities of e exploding these helicopters, we actually trained with the firefighters of Zurich in order to see if these robots could actually become really useful in our society. So, in April 2012, we actually simulated a search and rescue operation where a swarm of three autonomous microhelicopters were surveying an unknown area, exploring it, and then localize a victim. But probably the main question that uh, most of you are asking is, how can these helicopters navigate completely autonomously? Well, in order to answer this question, a robot needs to, needs to know where it is. And uh, we, know, we actually, we robotics call this problem localization. Because if a robot knows where it is with respect to a map, then it can plan its next action towards the goal. So, why not using then GPS? That would be extremely helpful and actually easy. Well, the point is that uh, we did not use GPS, as I said before. The main reason is, for that is that GPS does not work indoors. And even outdoors is not a reliable service. In fact, uh, I'm sure that uh, most of those of you who have uh, um, a car e equipped with a GPS car navigation system or a smartphone with GPS have experienced a thousand of times getting lost in a city, right? So it's not really a reliable service. So our question was, uh, what if robots could see? What does it mean? How can we answer this question? So I would kindly ask you to have a look, a careful look at these two videos. Which one of the two videos catches your attention the most? probably is the left video, right? Because in that video, you can actually see um, a swarm of multiple helicopters performing some choreographies and um, formation flight. But actually, both of these two videos are very impressive, but the technologies behind are completely different. In fact, as a matter of fact, the robots of the left video are completely blind. They do not see by themselves, but they actually see through external eyes through the eyes of an external system of cameras that we call a motion capture system. It's the same system that uh, they use in Hollywood to make uh, 3D movies, to capture the movements of the, of the actors. And also, there are special markers installed on the, on the robots. 
Motion capture systems are very, very robust systems that actually allow to track the position of the robots with the sub-millimeter accuracy and uh, very reliably. And they are actually very interesting for us researchers because they allow us to focus on controlled strategies without dealing with the challenges of perception. But if you think about uh, application in real-world scenarios like search and rescue, the problem with motion capture systems is that they need to be pre-installed in the environment where the robots are supposed to navigate. So you cannot think of uh, going to a building after an earthquake, install the cameras and then send these helicopters. It's, it's really unforeseeable. That's why we developed the robots that you could see in the right videos. These robo robots, conversely, they can see by themselves. In order to see, they are equipped with a single camera, which is installed on board and is down looking. And this camera does for the robot exactly what the, the eye does for a human. It allows the robot to see and perceive the environment. But how does it work? So remember, the main question for a robot to be truly autonomous, it has to know where it is, it has to localize. So basically, it has to know where it is with respect to a reference frame, like a map. So how do we do that? Well, imagine that the helicopter is flying and it captures a picture. Then it moves to a second position and it captures a second picture. What we do is that we develop some advanced image analysis algorithms. And basically, the helicopter extracts some interest point from the images, for example, corners, and also from the second image. And then we match these points according to some similarity measure. And then we use uh, some uh, computer vision theory that allow us to reconstruct the points in 3D. So basically, we build a sparse 3D map. The map is made of points. And then uh, if we iterate this procedure for every couple of frames that we take over the motion, we can actually reconstruct the full trajectory of the helicopter and simultaneously build the map of the environment. So, one of the um, main uh, problems when we work with helicopters is not just uh, um, estimating uh, their own trajectory and building a map, but also the important thing is to maintain, to remain stable. In order to remain stable, the helicopter needs uh, to maintain a local estimate of the vertical direction. That in this uh, picture is uh, indicated by the blue arrow. The problem is that uh, when we sum all the little motions of the robots over time, they, we actually accumulate errors, which can lead the map to appear bent, like in this picture here. Which means that after a while, the helicopter will have a wrong estimate of the vertical direction, which would lead the helicopter inevitably to crash. So, in fact, a camera is not sufficient in order to fly autonomously. And uh, therefore, we decided to complement our vision system with an inertial sensor. An inertial sensor does for a robot what the vestibular system does for a human. It provides the robot with the information about its orientation. And basically, what the robot does is that it compares the information from the inertial sensor with the information from the camera, and then it detects the conflict and is able to correct both its pose and also the map. So, so far we have talked about uh, a single helicopter. We have learned how to make it fly autonomously. But now the question is, uh, how can we extend uh, this uh, technology, not to just one robot, but to two, three, or even n of these robots? Maybe each of them building its own map. So the qu main question is, uh, how do the robots know that, that, for example, they are exploring the same environment? And uh, if they know that they're exploring the same environments, how can the robot fuse all this information together, and therefore all the maps together into a single map? In order to do this, for example, we have to identify that uh, the set of points observed by the red helicopter is the same as the, this set of points observed by the green helicopter. When we have identified these correspondences, what we can do is that we can compute the aligning transformation, and then we can fuse the maps together. Accordingly, we can, for example, identify that these points are the same as those observed by the blue helicopter, and then we, again, we can compute the aligning transformation and fuse 
the third map together. So we then put all these pieces together. We went to the firefighters' uh, training area of Zurich, and uh, again, we demonstrated our technology with uh, three helicopters. And what you can see in this video is actually three helicopters that are starting from three different locations. They do not know initially that they are exploring the same environment. And they do not even know their initial location with respect to each other. So these are actually challenges that are solved in real time by the helicopters. So initially, they do not know where they are. But as soon as an overlap between uh, the individual maps is detected, the maps are merged together. And what you can see in this video is actually two helicopters with uh, um, streaming also onboard camera images. You can see in the left pictures uh, the feature points, the uh, interest points that we extract in order to build the map. And at the end, the two helicopters join and they fuse again the maps together. And here, for comparison, we actually decided to overlay the two maps built by the two helicopters on a satellite image. So, so far we have talked uh, about theory, about, we have shown many videos, but uh, I would like to give you a real taste of what it means working with these research platforms. And that's why, actually, we are going to give you a live demonstration. And I would like to invite here three of my collaborators, who are Stefan, Marcus, and Simon. So what we are going to see now, you will see that there is going to be a net that is going to be pulled up. Because the helicopter is going to fly over your heads. And in order to protect myself and my collaborators, we decided to pull up the net. <laughs> no, of course, it's not true. Actually, it's, for, it's the other way around. It's actually for your own safety, even though there is actually really nothing to risk. I mean, in three years, we never got uh, not anybody injured, and this platform is really, is really safe. <laughs> OK. Marcus, when you want, guys. So now, Marcus is, uh, besides being a researcher, is also a professional pilot who has uh, an experience over several years. And uh, he's now controlling manually the helicopters because he wants to show you what it means controlling this helicopter. This helicopter, as you can see, is extremely agile, extremely maneuverable. But don't try. I tried this myself the first time and it crashed immediately. You actually need several years, really, to become as good as Marcus is currently. Because the problem with this helicopter is that uh, you need to control not only the position in three dimensions, but also the orientation of this robot in three dimensions. So basically, you have a six control input. So now what we are showing there on, the, on that video is actually the onboard camera images. And you can see the interest points that we are extracting that uh, I talked to you about late, uh, earlier. And those points will now be used in order to do some uh, autonomous operation. For safety reasons, we are not going to do an, uh, an autonomous uh, large exploration, but we will actually want to show you how the platform gets extremely stable when it's just relying on vision. OK, guys, you can go. So as you can see, Marcus is not touching the, the, the remote controller anymore. What is the, the, um, the grid that you see there? The grid actually is an augmented reality grid. It doesn't exist in reality. It is being projected virtually by the robot because it represents for us humans the reference frame. It's actually the coordinate system that the robot needs to have in order to localize itself. Okay? When you're ready, now we are going to show you some uh, autonomous uh, maneuvers. Marcus is always there ready as a backup in case something goes wrong. But he's not touching the buttons of the remote controller, as you can see. So um, what Stefan and Simon are doing is that they are telling the helicopter which kind of pattern it has to move on. In fact, this, is, this environment is completely different from the environments that we usually work with, which are usually outdoors, and uh, we have the freedom to explore them all around. While here, we have the constraint also that uh, not only it's a smaller environment, but also we have the problem that uh, in order to see the robot need, needs texture. And because the stage doesn't have any texture, we actually added a carpet, OK? And what you can see, this movement, these little movements that the helicopter is performing are completely autonomous. 
So, uh, so as I said, the carpet there, it was not known by the robot in advance, it was completely unknown. But there, it's just there in order to provide texture, so for the robot to see something. Otherwise, the, the stage is too textureless. So what was that? That happened because uh, the robot uh, suddenly lost track of the fissures, of the, of the interest point on the, on, the, on the ground. The reason was that uh, the carpet is too small. So when it gets too high, it basically the, the visible area is so small that the helicopter has to remain in the sand. While, of course, if we work outdoors, there are many natural fissures from the ground, and therefore the, this problem will not exist. Actually, we were able to fly up to um, how much was 70 meters in height in early. And now Stefan is going to risk his life. No, <laughs> joking. So he's going to pull the helicopter to show you that the helicopter is trying to stabilize, to remain stable in the center of the map. And you see, the, uh, the helicopter detects that somebody is pulling it, and then it reacts with the force in the counter direction. OK? So it's a smart helicopter. OK, you can land. And with this, I would like to conclude uh, this presentation. And I would like to thank you for all your attention. And thank you to Marcus, Stefan, and Simon, and our helicopter, of course. Thank you very much.